Thank you all for being here today. It's, it's great to see a you know, good turnout for this. My name is Michael Artiger. I am a VP of Marketing and Strategic Partnering for Virusite. And I think this is the third year that we've been here um, with the virus scanner. We've got a booth downstairs, booth number two. Um, so if you have any questions or I don't, I don't answer all the uh, questions that you may have, please feel free to stop by and, and talk to us. I'm gonna take the first 20, 25 minutes to give you a quick overview, and then I do wanna leave five minutes at least at the end for questions, so um, you know, please feel free to ask those questions when we get there. And so we're with, uh, with, with Virusite. We're a company based out of Colorado. We are focused on vir virus quantification, rapid virus quantification. That is our, our, our primary focus. And, um, but within that marketplace, there are a lot of different application areas. Um, viruses, as you know, there's a paradox here, right? They cause disease, but they're also increasingly a tool to prevent disease. And uh, the breadth and diversity of these applications continues to grow at almost an exponential rate. But our primary focus areas are in viral vaccines, in protein expression, most notably using baclovirus to express proteins, either as therapies or as vaccines. Uh, and the viral vectors, which is uh, the, the focus of this track, and uh, great to see a lot of um, you know, key opinion leaders here in this area. And that's what the bulk of my talk is going to be about, you know, using our analytical instrument to basically in real time quantify how much virus you have in both upstream growth out, uh, settings and then downstream as you start to purify the viral vector to get to your final product that you then uh, inject into the patient. Uh, but before I, I jump into that, I realize there are a lot of folks here who are working on viral vaccines and protein expression. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes touching on these, you know, top you know, 30,000 foot view. Um, as we all know, there's increasing pressure to respond more rapidly to emerging pandemic threats. Um, flu has always been one of the most notable, but you know, Zika virus, who knew about Zika virus a year ago and the impact it's having um, beyond you know, traditional viral diseases. And there's been a lot of investments in new growth systems, moving away from traditional egg-based manufacturing because of the problems with sourcing very clean eggs. It takes one to two eggs to produce one dose of the flu virus. Um, not all flu strains grow very well in the chicken egg. That was um, uh, most notably H1N1 in 2009. And then novel vaccine modalities, virus like particles, subunit vaccines, nanoparticles, that are really pushing the capabilities of analytical systems. Many of these are not infective. Virus like particles by design are not infective. So black tiger won't work on that. Um, a lot of these do not have a genome by design. So qPCR won't work on them. So a lot of traditional quantification technologies are not amenable to these new methods of creating vaccines. Um, new strains. You know, some of these strains that change on a fairly rapid basis, like flu, you have to design new detection systems, new antibodies if you're doing HPLC or ELISA-based ELISA -based, um, methods, new primers for, for qPCR. So you, there's a, it's a constantly moving target as far as developing the reagents for these other detection systems. And a lot of these methods, plaque titer, um, you know, uh, TCID 50, things like that, take days or a week or more to get the results. So you have to put your growth system on hold or you have to take a leap of faith and say, I think we've reached the maximum amount of virus we're gonna get. Let's go ahead and harvest without really knowing until after the fact. And then of course for in-process purification, it becomes very cumbersome to try and wait for these, uh, these results. Protein expression, uh, I know there's a lot of folks here who've really spent their careers focusing on, on optimizing Baclovirus, BACMAM, new emerging methods uh, for baclovirus-based expression systems. Um, but this has been a main focus area for us as far as being able to track how much baclovirus you have and then to track how much of the baclovirus-derived products you have. Um, is it a BLP that you're, that you're synthesizing using the baclovirus? Is it a protein, uh, et cetera? But the focus for today is really um, on the challenges of viral vector quantification. And I think to sum it up here, what we're seeing is that as more of these products make it to the clinic and are approaching market launch, people are really starting to figure out, okay, how do we scale this? How do we get enough of this product?
product? How do we get um, a better understanding of how pure it is, how clean it is, so that we don't incur, uh, encounter some of the problems that we had in the past with you know, injecting too much of the particle, having immune response, the caps of protein, etc. I call this viral therapy. Basically, it's a broad term for using a virus to treat a disease, and this, this includes gene therapy, it includes oncolytic viruses, so you know, designing, engineering viruses to target and kill uh, tumor cells. I think this really speaks to the, the breadth of the different viruses that are used as, as vectors, and this is not all-inclusive, which you can see the top three, top four, adeno, rhea, excuse me, retro, um, vaccinia, adeno-associated virus, et cetera. And then the, the different diseases that are being targeted by these viral vectors too increases to grow as well. But I really want to highlight here, and this is from a 1998 guidance from the FDA, so many years ago before we really got um, as far as we have in the evolution of the field, that given the potential toxicity of, in this case, adenoviral particles themselves, the FDA recommends that patient dosing be based on particle number. Well, those of you who work with viruses know that getting particle numbers has been very challenging in the past. Um, you basically had to use TEM. qPCR gives you genome copies or genome equivalents, but that does not give you definitive association of the genome with the particle. And sometimes you get overestimates based on qPR data because you have genomes that are not associated with the particle or, or particles or fragments of a genome that are not associated with the particle. So that's what we've really focused on, is enabling essentially real-time particle quantification for viruses. Just a brief overview of the technology. That's the instrument, Virus Counter 3100. We've got a, a demo of this down at the, the booth downstairs. And at its heart, it's a flow cytometer. But it's a flow cytometer that's developed specifically for virus particle quantification. And we've developed a number of different detection methodologies that I'll talk about shortly here. Um, it does come in both the standalone version and one that's coupled to a 9612 plate uh, auto sampler. So if you have a lot of samples you need to process, um, you can load that up and run that overnight and have your data ready for you the next morning. Uh, and this is a screenshot of that software. It's got mapping, so if you're using the same uh, groups of viruses, you can map that through that template repeatedly for those samples. It, uh, it also is ready for use in GMP environments, so it has 21, part CF, 21 CFR Part 11 capable software. So if you're going into manufacturing environments, it is ready to, uh, to do that. So previously, we launched the instrument using ComboDye, and ComboDye is a sort of like one-size-fits-all detection system. It uses a general protein stain and a general nucleic acid stain. And only when it sees both those signals above background simultaneously does it count that as an intact virus particle. The benefits there is that it's simple, you know, it's, it's uh, universal, but it does suffer when you've got a very dirty background or very complex uh, matrix. So if you're taking a sample directly from you know, a bioreactor or from a chicken egg, you've got a lot of background protein, a lot of background nucleic acids, and that can bring up the background such that it's hard to differentiate the particle from the, the noise in the system. So because of that, we launched late last year an antibody-based detection system. This was based on a lot of feedback from our customers saying, you know, Compadai works in certain situations, but I wish I, I could use an antibody against my virus of interest to get very specific quantification. And they both provide value, depending upon how you're using them. And so we, based on that feedback from our user groups, we were able to prioritize which viruses to start to go after. And so we launched, to date, Baclovirus Virotag. We've launched Adenovirus Virotag. We've launched AAV2 and 3. Viratag, and then next week we'll be launching um, Viratag for influenza. It's actually a pan-reactive um, reagent that recognizes every flu A and flu B strain that we've tested thus far. And AAV 5 and 8 are also on the drawing board. But we'll continue to innovate and move through those most commonly used viruses because that's what the, you know, the, the market has asked for. Uh, the advantages of this approach obviously are very specific high affinity. Um, broad 
applicability for both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And because it's worked on the smallest viruses, we've tested AAV, we know we can span the entire range of sizes of viruses from the smallest to the largest. And it's also amenable to virus-like particles, so long as that VLP expresses the antigen that this, the antibody um, recognizes. The workflow of the Virotag reagents, uh, five microliters are added to 195 microliters of sample. And that could be a diluted sample too. We typically recommend like a one to five dilution. It incubates for 30 minutes. Um, you can actually push that to 15, I've done that myself. And it's a no wash assay um, because the viruses are for small particles, it's typical to, to centrifuge them down and uh, separate out the unbound from the bound. We actually optimize the um, stoichiometry of the reagent such that you don't have to wash it. And then it's ready to analyze on the virus count, which is a one minute analysis time. So it gives you the number of virus particles per ml in that one minute. Quick screenshot here of the Virotag software. Probably can't see this from the back of the room, but the x-axis here is time, and then the y-axis is voltage. So we're basically quantifying the fluorescence as voltage. What you can see are unique virus events over that time period. Down here is the full one minute, and we're just looking at a very small uh, snapshot of that one minute analysis time. And up here at the top, it gives you the result, which in this case was 1.4 uh, E8 virus particles per ml. So again, that's a one minute analysis time. And for the next few minutes, I'm gonna give you two case studies for viral vectors that we've quantified using this antibody-based detection method, adenovirus and then AAV2 and 3. So whenever possible, we try and find a broadly reactive antibody that's been well characterized, we know functionally how it works. And we were lucky to find an antibody for adenovirus, which recognizes every serotype that we tested so far. I think there's 41 serotypes of adenovirus. Um, this antibody uh, recognizes intact virus particles, so it binds to the hexon protein and it has to see a certain confirmation in the hexon protein, which is the intact confirmation. Uh, again, we've tested against multiple serotypes, not every serotype, because we just don't have access to all 41, but the, the, all those that we've tested have worked very well, and, and it's worked brilliantly for the crude and purified samples. How am I doing my time? So what we like to do when we validate these uh, reagents is do a dilution series. And we can start as high as one to five and go down one to 5,000, depending upon what the starting concentration of the virus is. And so in this case, I'm showing you adenovirus four and five and showing a nice linear titration with dilution. We like to see that. And typically we like to see the slope be as close to negative one as possible and a good R squared value so that the points are all fitting nicely to the, to the slope. Um, and so this, this tracks as we would expect if it was specific for the, for the virus. Again, AD4, but we also wanted to make sure that it's not cross-reacting with other viruses. So we tested influenza and lentivirus and showed that it was below the limited detection of the instruments. So that was encouraging that it's specific. And we've also done some in-process testing of adenovirus to show that after harvest, so crude would be post-harvest, at each step of purification, so in this case, um, nucleus treated, column A, column B, filtration in bulk, we could track how much virus there was at each step in that process. Because that's the ultimate goal here, that's the brass ring, is to enable real-time virus quantification during upstream and downstream bioprocessing. And then uh, a quick snapshot of some results uh, that we've obtained for adeno-associated virus. Uh, we, we looked, could not find any pan-reactive AAV antibodies. Um, There's some talk out there about a camelid antibody, if anybody knows this actually exists, come talk to me because we were ne never able to find it in reality. So we, we broke it down into, we found an antibody that bounds both AAV2 and 3. 
and that was launched uh, back in January, and we're working on five and eight, and that should be launching very soon. And we'll continue to add to this based on customer feedback. Um, I think nine and 10 are, are AAV stereotypes that have um, a fair amount of interest. So please come talk to us, help us, help inform our product development efforts. We, we appreciate the feedback. And so again, showing that it tracks nicely with dilution for AAV2 and AAV3, and then that it doesn't bind to other AAV stereotypes that it's not supposed to. So AAV9, sample dilution buffer is our blank control. We do see some, some background start to come up at the least dilute preparations. We think that's probably a mass effect issue with the uh, antibody. And again, we don't really see specificity for baclovirus or influenza virus here as well. So really the, the take home message here is that, you know, Viratag is a, a category of products, it's a portfolio, it continues to grow, we continue to add reagents to it. I'm trying to focus today on viral vector quantification, um, but we'll you know, definitely start to work on other uh, vectors, other viruses, and uh, bring those to the marketplace. Direct, specific, now biologically relevant, which I think um, is in contrast to some other particle counters out there that give you particle count, but not biologically relevant particle count. Uh, it is 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, and at the end of the day, the goal here, the brass ring, was to allow real-time tracking of particle count through growth and purification systems, regardless of what the application for the virus is. So that basically you know, opens the question to what is your process and how would you benefit being able to track, sorry, being able to track particle count during you know, different growth systems, harvest, and all the way to the final um, packaging of that product for administration. So that's pretty much the end of, of my presentation. This is my contact information. Um, send me an email if you want to follow up with me and, and get deeper into to your world. I'm happy to answer any questions with like a few minutes left. Yeah, yeah, some minutes. Um, and then also come down to the booth and, and check in with us. Uh, so please, any questions? So when you're... Um the figure that you showed with your timeline, obviously that must mm -hmm. have been at an optimal dilution because all your peaks are nicely separated except for one where there was like a dual peak and it looked like yeah. a, a coincidence of two events together there on the right hand side. So th does your software um, compensate for your, for your, uh, for your uh, boot mix? Yeah, so that's a great question. Can people hear the question in the back of the room? Kind of. So, no. Okay. So uh, Hans' question, a great question, by the way, um, is, you know, this is this is one dilution, obviously. And if you had a dilution series, you process additional samples after this, and you can see these are very distinct events here. But what is this? Well, that's a, that's a doubler, right? So in this case, that's probably two particles passing very close to one another in the laser. So there wasn't enough space between them for the signal to go back down to background. And in this case, what we'd say is, this is probably a little too concentrated. You're not in the sweet spot for that virus. We want to make sure that you're counting every single virus independently. So the upper range is you're getting coincidence. So viruses are too concentrated and they're passing too closely together. At the lower end of the range, you're getting too dilute and you're not getting enough individual events to have statistical significance. So that's what really um, you know, demarcates the upper and lower thresholds. Does that answer your question? Does the software correct for any coincidence of particles? The software automatically calculates the background, but it's, it's basically up to the user to say, okay, based on the data output, we're, we're starting to see too many um, you see, what happens is the peak broadens, right? So the system will say the average peak width and peak height. It calculates and, and uh, retains that information. If you start to see your peak width broaden out, then you know you need to go to a uh, more dilute sample at that point. Any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, are you looking to any <laughs> matrix defect? Matrix defect. So the question is, have we looked into any matrix effects? So we have tested Viratag by in intentionally adding protein serum to the sample, and uh, we do not see any loss of signal by doing that, because the Viratag is specific, to, it's an antibody-based detection system specific to the virus, and does not suffer or is not impacted by high protein or high nucleic acid background. Uh, I guess comparing to the virus that it's secreted into the uh, medium, or comparing to the virus that inside the cell that you have to break up the cell acid versus superintendent, is there any differences? Uh, that's a good question. So he's asking if, if you have a, um, a budded virus versus a lytic virus, do you see any difference? And no, we have not seen any difference. Thank you. Is that time for another question? Yeah, another question. So is the system designed uh, the virus has to identify itself as a antigen, or can you use some other like particles in some way and to, to stay inside the same time? Yeah, the question, a great question, is um, is Viratag designed or limited to external antigens on the virus, or can you get reagent inside the virus particle? We've not tested that. So the combo dye that I mentioned, sort of the general one-size-fits-all detection system, protein stain, nucleic acid stain, we know that that nucleic acid stain can, by and large, get into the particle, but that's a very small <coughs> molecule. With an antibody, I'd be very surprised if the antibody could actually get into the particle without having to disrupt it. But it may vary. It may depend on virus to virus and the structure of these, these viruses. One more question? Yeah, I, uh, the, the influenza virus that mm -hmm. you're launching, have you tried that on uh, VLPs? Uh, Chris's question is the Viratech for influenza. Have we tested that in VLPs? The answer is yes, we actually have. Um, and we've shown it works extremely well. Uh, and so it is a pan-reactive antibody. Um, and it, it does appear to, even though it was developed several years ago, it does seem to recognize newer strains of virus and both the wild type virus as well as VLPs are expressing H5, H7, H9 on the particle. So it appears to be a very strong reagent for us. Use antibodies are they uh, marked somehow, labeled the antibodies or not? Yes, they are. They're labeled. Yes. So we, it wouldn't work. Correct. So we take an antibody. You know, it could be a commercial available antibody. It could be your antibody that you you produce. Label it with a fluorescent molecule that is excited by the laser in the in the uh, fire scanner and emits in the appropriate wavelength for us to detect it. And so we've got a very well defined manufacturing protocol label it, clean it up, and uh, create a very uh, robust reagent. So are these antibodies only directed to complete capsids for relief? Or do you, are there also detection responses uh, isolated epitopes and antigens? Yeah, the question is, are these antibodies against only intact capsid proteins or, or different variants of the capsid proteins? And it's, it basically depends on the virus. So the adenovirus antibody does recognize intact hexon protein. Uh, the um, baclovirus recognizes GP64. Um, the influenza recognizes apparently, you know, every strain, every type of human gluten that they've tried so far. So it's case by case. Mm -hmm. So, if there are no other questions, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.